Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us Professor Norman Finkelstein. Norman is an American political scientist and activist. His primary fields of research are the politics of the Holocaust and Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He is the author of several books, including Gaza and Inquest into His Martyrdom. Norman, welcome back to India and Global Left. Well, thank you for having me on again. I want to discuss the ongoing genocide in Palestine, but I, I, I think since you have been speaking so much, it's uh, it's worth taking a step step back and start with your analogy of the slave rebellion of 1831 and uh, what happened on October 7, because I thought that was one of your most remarkable intervention into the public debate about how to interpret the events on October 7. So can you just lay out your central thesis uh, as a preface to a broader discussion? Uh, there were two aspects to what happened on October 7th. There was the factual aspect, which still remains kind of, it still remains murky. There can't be any doubt, I think, that uh, Hamas committed significant atrocities on October 7th, but doubts still remain, or let's just say it still remains murky, uh, the magnitude of the atrocities that occurred, the motives of Hamas as an organization, the extent to which some of the atrocities were personal initiatives, acts of vengeance, acts of revenge, and the extent to which the atrocities were part of the operational orders, um, the extent to which the Israeli military response was uh, accountable for a portion of the atrocities. And then there were specific allegations made pertaining to beheadings of babies, which Israel seems to have dropped, judging by its statements before the International Court of Justice. And then there was the separate issue of the uh, sexual violence in particular, the alleged rapes that occurred. There, I think, uh, no significant evidence has been put forth that the rapes that occurred, assuming rapes did occur, uh, the rapes were part of a systematic, methodical, uh, operational plan. Uh, so that's one broad category, namely the category of what happened, the factual side. As I already said, I think aspects of it, and I would say critical aspects of it, remain murky. That's not altogether unprecedented. You take the case of the Nazi Holocaust, which is probably the most documented atrocity uh, in academic scholarly life. Nonetheless, two fundamental questions remain unanswered. When did it begin? And why did Hitler, well, it's not, we don't even know if Hitler gave an order. There's still speculation that there was an order, but it's not been revealed. But why? when the decision was made and why the decision was made, now, that's perfectly it's perfectly obvious those are critical questions, the when and the why. You learn at a very young age, in grade school, I learned it, that the critical questions in journalism always are who, what, when, where, how, and why. I remember learning that in library class, it must have been sixth grade who, what, when, where, how, and why. And in the case of the Nazi Holocaust, even though it's the most documented, most exhaustively documented atrocity in academic and scholarly life, of those six questions, 
We do know the who, though aspects of the who are very unevenly documented, which is to say the participants in the Nazi ho Holocaust in the various uh, satellite countries, the participants in uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and so forth, there's still, uh, there the scholarship is still very, very much at an early stage. So we know the who, though it's unevenly documented, the who. We know the what, what happened, yeah, I think, basically. We know the where. We don't know the when. We don't know the why. And the how is very unevenly documented because half of the how was not uh, death camps, it was just out in the field where Jews were shot to dead. So there's a certain amount of distortion as to the how. The normal assumption is the how was gas chambers and so forth, but that was actually about half the victims were in the gas chambers. And I would say on the how, uh, I don't want to, I, I have not studied the literature in the last 20 years. I stopped when I wrote this book on Daniel Goldhagen with Ruth Bettina Byrne. And uh, then I wrote The Holocaust Industry. And then I really stopped reading on it, which is already a quarter of a century ago. And there's been a voluminous literature, scholarly literature since then, mostly by Germans. Uh, German young scholars, young German scholars. I would say, if you look carefully at the literature I read up until 25 years ago, the the actual scholarship on the gas chambers has been was quite sparse. The actual scholarship was quite sparse, uh, which enabled. Holocaust deniers, revisionists, to make sorts of claims which weren't easily answerable. There were all sorts of claims about how could you have killed and disposed of so many bodies and so forth. In any event, so to return to your question, and this was a long digression, to return to your question, the factual side is murky but we know enough to know Hamas committed serious uh, uh, crimes, serious atrocities. So that part, I think we can take as a given serious atrocities occurred. But then the second question is, how do we morally evaluate them? What happened? And once atrocities occur, then you have to say, well, the normal legal standards, the laws of war apply, which is to say, if they constituted war crimes or at a higher level crimes against humanity, or even at a higher level, what's called acts of genocide. Uh, it can't seriously, in my opinion, be called a genocide. However, there may be an argument I'm not refined enough to make these kinds of uh, discriminations. Maybe it constitutes an act of genocide, um, but that's still a legal category. And I have said, and I said it when I was asked by Pierce Morgan, that legally they have to be held culpable, held culpable for those crimes Although were I their attorneys, and I'm not averse to playing that role, I would certainly believe that uh, clemency is warranted in the case of young men who were born into a concentration camp. Um, but that still didn't leave them leave open, didn't still answer the moral question which is you can acknowledge atrocities occur, but then what moral judgment do you pass on 
these young men who were born into a concentration camp and uh, committed these atrocities. Uh, and I struggled with that question because part of me, probably because I was too close to the material or I was close enough to mater the material. Uh, I had spent 15 years just going through these human rights reports on the various atrocities that Israel had inflicted on the people of Gaza. Uh, the daily atrocities of this blockade, which Richard Goldstone in the Goldstone report said incredibly rose to the level of a crime against humanity. The daily reality of that criminal blockade of Gaza. And then that criminal blockade was periodically punctuated by these high-tech massacres, what Israel called operations in Gaza. Having been close to that material, I found it very hard in me to condemn the perpetrators of those atrocities. And I then tried to figure out what was the closest situation analogous enough that I can see how it's been reasoned in the past. And the closest I could get was the slave uprisings, the slave revolts in American history. And once I felt confident that that was a reasonable analogy, my next step was to see how the abolitionists, those who fought against uh, slavery, how did they react to the slave revolts? And it came as a kind of relief to me, a moral sucker for me, that the, the most famous of the abolitionists at that time, well, there were several, but certainly one of the uh, most famous, uh, there was uh, Charles Sumner, there was Wendell Phillips, uh, and there was William Lloyd Garrison. There were others I'm leaving now. Uh, the most, one of the best known, William Lloyd Garrison. He was the editor of a newspaper called The Liberator, and it was very clear from his commentary after Nat Turner's rebellion that although he recognized atrocities had occurred and horrors had unfolded, which they did, there's no question about that. Unlike in the case of Gaza, Nat Turner's uh, re rebels, they did behead babies. There's no question about that and they smashed skulls, uh, and they committed disembowelings. It was a very ugly uh, turn of events. And that Turner's order to his rebel crowd was kill all whites. That was very simple and straightforward. Uh, but notwithstanding that, Basically, William Lloyd Garrison's position was, we told you so. He directed his ire, not at the perpetrators of the rebellion, but at those who passively or actively participate in the system that dehumanized an entire group of people and Garrison said, we told you so. If you treat people this way, uh, you will reap what you have sown. And he never once, although he acknowledged atrocities occurred and horrors had occurred, if you read carefully his statement, he never once actually and directly condemned Nat Turner. And that was true in his private correspondence as well. Uh, 
I've read his correspondence on the question, and he was, uh, he said, you know, I'm a pacifist. He was a pacifist, and they believed in the pacifists, the abolitionist pacifists. They believed in what they called moral suasion, that is, to try to persuade the country that what they were doing was wrong. But he said, if anybody had a just grounds for using violence, he said, well, personally, I oppose it. But if anybody had a just grounds for using violence, he said it was the slaves. And I do believe if anybody had a just right to use violence, it was the uh, those young men who were born into a concentration camp. Where every other, every other option, every other option had been extinguished. The Hamas did communicate. It was ready for a settlement along the lines of the international consensus for resolving the conflict. They issued many statements along those lines. There were problems there. I'm not going to deny it because they were insistent on full implementation of the right of return uh, of the Palestinian refugees. And that is a problem in my opinion as a practical matter, but there was never any attempt to negotiate. They were simply dismissed out of hand. They then tried nonviolence in March, 2018, the great March of return. And all they got for it was a couple of hundred Palestinians killed and several tens of thousands of them were injured and not an insignificant number were injured um, with life-changing injuries as the Israeli snipers targeted the kneecap and the low of the nonviolent protesters, and even not protesters, people who were 300, 300 meters from the border and who were just leaning against trees. Uh, so tens of thousands of injured, including a significant number with or willful, purposeful, life-changing injuries. And then, so diplomacy was a dead end. A diplomatic settlement was a dead end. Nonviolence was a dead end. And by the time of October 6th, uh, it, to the extent that the conflict was, or the region was still in the news, it was with the expectation that Saudi Arabia would uh, signed the agreement with the U.S. and Israel, and the conflict, the, the, the Middle East conflict, would be resolved over the heads of the Palestinians. And so the fate for the Palestinians in Gaza was to be confined, immured in a concentration camp, left there to languish and die. I do not believe that's in any way an exaggeration of where matters stood on October 6th. So I am very averse, reluctant to condemn what happened on October 7th. Uh, atrocities are appalling for sure, but being born into and having no prospect whatever except to languish and die in a concentration camp is also appalling. One of the things that I found in your article about uh, or, or column about the Net Turner Rebellion was religion itself. Uh, you wrote that Net Turner was incredibly steeped in religion and attempts were made at the time to say that what he or they did was because of religious fanaticism and this was not limited to net turner rebellion the 
White Lotus Rebellion in China in the 1790s, the great upsurge in India in the revolt of 1857. All of them had deep political and economic underpinnings behind and immediately the counter reactionary forces, sometimes it's the Qing state, sometimes it's the British state, would, would label the rebels as driven by some fanaticism and religion. And I wanted to bring this up because you also went on to then attack or criticize, uh, to euphemize, uh, Sam Harris and uh, and show how his language and what he advocates is very similar to the Nazis. So if you can spell that out a little bit for us. Well, uh, in the list you went through of uh, rebellions that had a religious... Uh, a religious uh, it's not so much content they, they, were, they used a religious idiom it's also true of the Boxer Rebellion um, in China the simple fact of the matter is different people use different languages in order to express their uh, discontents and usually they use a language which is easily available to them. So African-Americans who didn't go to school, who were overwhelmingly illiterate, they did have a rich church tradition. And Nat Turner in particular was by all accounts, he was hyper-literate. It was said that everyone, white and black, everyone, black and white, uh, paid deference to his intellect. Uh, but it was also true that he was universally dismissed subsequently after the rebellion as a religious fanatic and a religious a religious uh, insane, insane. He was insane in his religious, in his religiosity. And one of the comments about that dismissal of him as being religiously in, a religious fanatic, one of the comments was that the South had to believe that, because otherwise they would have to confront the injustice or the nature of the injustice that spurred Nat Turner on, the impetus behind his rebellion, and they didn't want to have to deal with that. So just briefly on, before we get to this yeah. character who passes by the name of Sam Harris, uh, just on the question of Nat Turner again, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I mentioned uh, William Lloyd Garrison's private correspondence on the Nat Turner Rebellion. And one sentence which I appreciated was, he said, quote, I do not justify the slaves in their rebellion, yet I do not condemn them. And I think that's the proper formulation. You don't justify what happened, but you also don't condemn them. So that, as I said, resonated for me. The other thing which I think is worth bearing in mind is even as I described this um, even as I described a rather grisly rebellion that was conducted by Mr. Turner and his confederates the historical verdict is not what one would expect namely now Turner occupies now an honored place in American history. So you will know the American historian, Eric Foner, 
probably the most authoritative, one, if not the most authoritative uh, scholars on slavery and the Civil War and then Reconstruction. Already way back in 1971, long before political correctness and then identity politics was the vogue. Already back then, he edited a volume. It was called Nat Turner. And the series for this volume, I'm holding it up now for your uh, audience, was titled Great Lives Observed. Now you must appreciate the irony of that. Matt Turner gave the order to kill all whites, beheaded babies, disemboweled others, smashed skulls. And now he is in a series called Great Lives Observed. And somebody emailed me an article. It was about this famous controversy surrounding a fictionalized account of Matt Turner's rebellion by a person named William Styron. And one of the great historians on slavery, Eugene Genovese, entered the debate. He's the author of the classic study, Roll, Jordan Roll. And he was what you might call a cantankerous leftist who eventually became quite far to the right, I would say. And he said in one of those articles I was reading, and now I'm quoting him, he said, Nat Turner led a slave revolt under extremely difficult circumstances and deserves an honored place in our history. Well, it does cause you or cause one to wonder, assuming humanity survives another 50 or so years, which is a question mark, but assuming it does, what the verdict will be on October 7th. I remember when it happened, people condemned it on two grounds, one moral and the other pragmatic. Moral because it was a hideous atrocity and pragmatic because what good came of it? All that came of it was the unleashing of a genocide. And I said at the time, too soon to tell. I don't know what's going to come of it. And certainly a whole sequence of events unfolded, which completely, totally shocked me. I was wrong on so much I don't say it proudly, but I don't say it ashamedly either. I was wrong. Who would have thought on October 7th that the International Court of Justice would enter into the fray and 15 judges out of 17 would say that Israel was committing, was plausibly committing a genocide? including the American judge. I would have bet every dollar, including up until the day before, there was no possibility whatsoever, zero, absolute zero, that the American judge would weigh in and say Israel was plausibly committing a genocide. Who would have thought on October 7th Two ragtag armies, two. One, Hamas, would not enable, would prevent Israel from declaring a military victory, even though Israel brought to bear everything in its 
armament, except for the nuclear weapons. And even the nuclear weapons, it's a question mark because Israel has already dropped the equivalent of two nuclear bomb, two Hiroshima sized bombs on Gaza. So you could say, actually, <laughs> atomic weapons were used, though on an incremental basis. And they couldn't defeat Hamas. They could not claim military victory. Who, who would have predicted that? Who would have predicted that the second ragtag army called the Houthis would completely disrupt world trade? And now you have this absolutely surreal situation what, with the American, the designated American diplomat to the Houthis trying to explain to the Houthis why their approach is not the best approach to help the Palestinians. <laughs> he's, trying, he's trying to explain to them why other approaches would be more productive. <laughs> I mean, you can't even make this stuff up. You can't even make this stuff up. The American counseling the the Houthis on better ways to help the Palestinians. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, really, life is stranger than fiction. Um, so all sorts of things happened which were unpredictable. I would say also unpredictable. Who would have thought Israel would have gotten away with killing 25,000 people, including about 12,000 children. Who would have predicted that? Nobody. Nobody, including myself. Who would have predicted that in an election year with public opinion decisively against what Biden is doing, he won't let up? I was sure he would stop by New Year's that he would tell the Israel time to wind this down. I was positive that he would order Israel to wind it down, but he won't let go. He won't let go. Now, maybe he was hoping that he can pull off the ceasefire and that then he would be acclaimed for his brilliant diplomacy and that would sail him into November. Well, it's not working. If you read the ceasefire proposal of Hamas, uh, it was published today. In the Lebanon newspaper, Al-Akbar. In al uh, That was very far from the, ce the ceasefire they were hoping for. That was a, that was a statement that said, you're not going to declare military victory. It's not going to happen. So, uh, quoting a famous statement by Foreign Minister Zhou Enlai about the French Revolution, he said in 19, early 1970s, when he was asked his opinion of the French Revolution, he famously replied, too soon to tell, uh, the lives of those who are dead are irrevocable, and there it's not too soon to tell. 25,000 people were killed, 12,000 of them children. And every time I walk the street and I see a smiling child, my first reaction is to smile back, and my second reaction is to remember 12,000 children like that child in front of me. Their lives were snuffed out by what happened in Gaza, by the Israeli genocide in Gaza. So there it's not too soon to tell. Those lives were irrevocably lost. On the other hand, what this will bring, I think it is correct to say it is a game changer. I, would, I did not want to hear that on October 7th because part of me wished this whole thing was over. I didn't want to 
have to resume where I left off three years ago. But it's clear. No, okay, I don't want to say it's clear because there are a lot of things which I thought were clear, which I was wrong about. But there seems to be good grounds for the belief that we've entered a new phase and that it's a very uh, ominous phase because Israel is determined to restore its what it calls its deterrence capacity, the Arab world's fear of it. And that means in the first place, delivering a spectacular military to defeat the Hamas, probably soon thereafter Hezbollah, and it will not accept anything less than such a military victory over the other side for practical reasons. Of course, there's an element of bloodlust to it, and there's an element of sadism to it, but there is a practical side to it, which you mean, which is that it fears that the Arab world no longer fears it. And the Arab world has gotten it into its head now that there is a military option against Israel. Now that was said by people like Syed Nasrallah for several years, but apart from the party of God, I don't think many people believed it. There was a belief that you can resist maybe to a stalemate periodically Israel because they were never able to declare a military victory after any of their operations. So you can resist to the point of a stalemate. But after October 7th, a belief did settle in among what's called the axis of resistance and beyond the axis of resistance, many, so to speak, ordinary folks in the Arab world that, hey, you know what? They're not really all that strong as we thought they were. They can, as Nasrallah correctly said, they're only capable of committing massacres. They are not capable of a military victory. All they can do is target, murder, annihilate civilian populations. So the new belief settled in in the Arab world that Israel can be militarily defeated and in conjunction with that after the genocide Israel has committed in Gaza the belief set in that we can't live with them it's us or them if you read Nasrallah's last speech or heard his last speech, he said, all those Israelis, they have double passports. They have American passports, British passports, French passports. And he said, they have to go. Palestine belongs to the indigenous population that Israel, Jewish Israel, is not a real nation, and they have to go. Well, as you can see, those are what used to be called in divorce cases, irreconcilable differences. And so I think we're now entering what's called popularly called a zero-sum game. And I don't see any possibility for diplomacy at this point. 
what do you mean when you say there is no possibility for diplomacy? I don't think either side would settle for any kind of diplomatic settlement. Israel is determined to humble, if not humiliate, the Arab, their Arab uh, adversaries. And the Arab resistance is now convinced they can inflict a permanent military defeat on Israel. Might take some time, but it's within reach. As somebody put it to me, it wasn't a bad expression. He said, it's the TikTok generation versus the party of God. The Israelis can't fight. I'm not, look, I'm no hero. I don't have that raw physical courage. So I'm not denigrating them. I'm just saying there's a factual matter. The party of God is ready to die. The only thing that holds them back now is because they know Israel will annihilate Lebanon, the civilian population, and then the civilian population will turn on them. But are they afraid to engage in battle with Israel? That's just ridiculous. They're not afraid at all. They relish the prospect. So I think we've entered a new, uh, very dark period. I guess in this equation, if we are to have a very long drawn sort of, whether it's high intensity or low intensity conflict, proceeding side by side with some sort of facade of diplomacy, then to my mind, I think the role of the US in the region becomes very critical because uh, a lot of what Israel does and is able to do with impunity is because of its uh, of the support that it gets from the US. And uh, you would note, but just for the viewers, like the apartheid case in South Africa proceeded on, along similar lines, like as long as the US administration stood behind uh, the, the white regime up until Reagan, it could, it could get away with impunity and things change once the US withdrew its support. We asked this question to both Jeffrey Sachs and Vijay Prashad, and they had quite different views on this. Jeffrey Sachs was more optimistic that increasing American increase increasing shift in American public opinion might be able to do something eventually in shifting American foreign policy. And Vijay Prashad, on the other hand, said that the he doesn't see any withdrawal of the American empire from the region. And looking from the American response to the three soldiers killed in Jordan, it seemed that Vijay was right. So his thoughts are along the lines that America is not going to withdraw from its region anytime soon. And then Israel becomes a very important strategic point for the US empire. What are your thoughts about, uh, about the situation? Um, Israel obviously is a critical player for the United States because it's the only uh, it's the only uh, power in the region with which the U.S. has a common language, cultural language. When uh, they go to Saudi Arabia or they go to the Emirates or they go to Bahrain or they go to Egypt, or they go to Jordan. They're speaking in their minds, they're speaking to the, the, the seventh century. Uh, whereas when they're with Israel, they're speaking with their uh, college roommates. Uh, the, it's a totally different relationship. And also there's so much intelligence cooperation and so much a revolving door between the Israelis and the Americans. They all know each other on the first name basis. They're all friends. Um, and there's a belief, not entirely wrong, but not entirely correct either, that Israelis have the technological competence, the mental know-how, uh, such that they represent an entirely different 
breathe than the so-called Arab allies. Uh, so for those reasons, Israel remains uh, a fundamental factor in US strategic thinking. Um, I don't know where that's going to lead us. The Israelis obviously want to attack Iran and the US is reluctant to take that step so far. Uh, and I don't know where that's going to go. I think the US is probably more realistic than the Israelis about taking that step. I think the Israelis are completely insane from a, you know, not, not in a moral sense. When I hear people like Benny Morris, the Israeli historian, keeps uh, pounding those war drums to attack Iran, I really have to ask myself, are these people so completely detached from reality? Hezbollah will annihilate Israel. This was a tiny place. Ezra, the Hezbollah has a very high level of technical competence, both in terms of the armaments they have and in terms of their ability to use them. Do they really believe that they could survive a Hezbollah attack in the event that the U.S. and Israel target Iran? I think that's completely nuts. Hezbollah knows every single vital nerve in Israeli society, like the, like the back of their hands. They know exactly what to target that will turn out to be terminal. So I, I, I can't even, I can't even grasp, as Oprah would say, I can't wrap my mind around what goes through the heads of these people. When I hear people like Benny Morris, I ask myself, have you not noticed that you can't even inflict a military defeat on Hamas? That it's already four and a half months and you haven't been able to successfully target a single Hamas leader in Gaza? That you don't even know where they are? That in this tiny, tiny, tiny parcel of land, this pinprick's pinprick on the world's map, this grain of sand in the Sahara, with all of your super sophisticated spy technology and all of what's called human, human, human intelligence in Gaza, all of those supporters of the Palestinian Authority who are now your spies, that you don't even know where the hostages are. You don't have a clue where they are. And you think you're going to defeat Hezbollah and Iran? Or you think you'll use your nuclear weapons and get away with it? That Nasrallah won't understand that if you nuke Iran, Hezbollah is next and he won't preemptively finish you off? I don't get these people. Now, what? I admit not having military knowledge, but certain things are pretty obvious. They've not been able to defeat Hamas. They weren't able to do so in 2008-9 during Cast Lead. They weren't able to do so during Pillar of Defense. They weren't able to do so during Protective Edge and with no restraints whatsoever, none. And after four and a half months, they've not been able to do it 
again. And you think you can take on Iran and the party of God? Doesn't make sense to me. We're in a very dark period. Because I do, as I said, I think Israel has a legitimate fear. I mean, maybe people aren't going to like what I'm saying, but I have to be honest about these things. There is now a view among the Arabs that Israel can be defeated. And Israel doesn't see any other option except to restore their deterrence capacity. And that means inflicting a military defeat on Hezbollah and inflicting significant enough death and destruction as to deter anybody from taking, following the lead from Hamas. Do you see any change of attitude among the U.S. allies in the Gulf with the recent? Oh, I'm sure they're. Listen, I'm sure they're rooting for Israel to win. You think so? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because any victory, any de any defeat for the, or any even partial defeat for Israel they see as a victory for what's called the axis of resistance. So they, they won. Look, look at what's happening now. If you look at the countries that supported the South African intervention at the ICJ, it did not include Saudi Arabia. It did not. There was, uh, Egypt eventually came on board Jordan eventually came on board, but the the Gulf states, with the exception of, the of Qatar, well, don't count me on that. Don't quote me on that because I'm not positive. They did not come on board. And Saudi Arabia was not there. As Christopher Gunnis, the former spokesperson for UNRWA, pointed out, it would be a fraction, excuse me, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of um, Saudi oil revenues to replace the United States and the European powers in financing UNRWA. The total figure comes to $440 million. That's how much M uh, MBS spends on prostitutes in a weekend. Or oh, prostitutes and liquor. On a weekend. Do you see them coming forward to replacing the US and the Europeans? It's nothing. It's small change for them, $440 million. They're not doing it. They want to see those guys and starve. Absolutely. They want that defeat. Because if Gaza is not defeated, the, the axis of resistance will take credit for it. And they don't want that. This is also very depressing in a way, isn't it? I mean... it's a, look, it's a very depressing situation. I said we're entering a dark period. Then it's a zero sum period. I was no, I did notice that in the Hamas uh, counter proposal, they didn't speak at all about ending the conflict. They talked about ending armed hostilities. One forty five days free phase of ceasefire or something, yeah. Yeah, a full Israeli withdrawal, a humanitarian end of the blockade, a humanitarian uh, relief, reconstru exchange. reconstruction, and everything. And exchange of hostages. Yeah, exchange of hostages for uh, uh, Israeli uh, Palestinians held in Israeli jails. Uh, they had a detailed plan and was a, uh, was a good document because it showed these people they have knowledge of the ground. They know exactly what needs to be done. And they know exactly the sequence it has to be done in. 
But what was noticeably uh, absent, because you have to recall, there's all this talk about what we're going to do the day after, and we have to re resuscitate the two-state settlement, and who's going to come in and govern, and what are the Palestinian authorities going to play a role? That was completely absent from the document. Mm -hmm. Totally absent. The only thing they were concerned about was the humanitarian side, the military side, uh, the reconstruction side, but nothing about an end to the conflict. And to military activity, military um, uh, exchanges, but not to end the conflict. What are your thoughts about the internal dynamics of politics, both within Palestine and in Israel? On one hand, it is said that there is a kind of competition between Hamas and Fatah, and that kind of competition drives Hamas towards one set of strategic actions. And on the Israeli side, it is said that if the right-wing coalition somehow collapses, then there can be some Oslo-type negotiations, whether it's good right. faith or bad faith. What are your thoughts on that? On the former question, I have no thoughts because I don't believe the Palestinian Authority is a factor anymore. The Palestinian Authority, they're so despised, so hated by the Palestinian people that they are just very visibly uh, agents, subcontractors for the Israelis, and uh, they're not a, in my opinion, a political factor. They're a bureaucracy uh, that serves- In, in Gaza, when you said they're not a political factor or, or in West Bank? Anywhere. They're a bureaucracy, they're an administration. But in terms of their strategy, their tactics, there's nothing. They just collect paychecks to repress the Palestinians and also to enable the, 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 the wheels of daily life to continue. They staff the administration, the bureaucracy that keeps the wheels turning each day. But in terms of a strategy or a tactics of a political movement, they're just observers on the sidelines. They have nothing whatever, they have nothing to do with anything. Are you talking about the top leadership or are you talking about the whole all organization itself? The whole, well, there is nothing. There is in the Palestinian administration. Mm -hmm. It takes up about 25% of the population of the West Bank is somehow employed, not somehow, is factually employed by the Palestinian Authority. It's an administration. But normally when you speak about administrations, you don't talk about tactics or strategy. There's no political movement. They just collect paychecks to uh, make life serviceable in the occupied Palestinian, in the West Bank. So I, I consider them a complete irrelevance. Uh, Abbas is, remember, Abbas, at the peak of his intellectual acuity, wrote a doctoral dissertation uh, denying the Nazi Holocaust. Now, that was at his mental peak. And now he's 88 years old. He's a corpse. He's a, I Sometimes I think he's just kept artificially alive by Israel. I'm not even sure if he's, he's even Abbas. It may just be a puppet with some artificial intelligence functioning as uh, the head of state. When when uh, Blinken goes to him, do you think they talk about anything of substance or it's just a follow-up? So to talk about him as having a, the Palestinian Authority as being a factor, to my thinking, is ridiculous. Secondly, there's talk now of Marwan Barghouti, the Fatah leader who's serving five life sentences, being released. He's one of the names on the Hamas 
list of people who have to be released in the prisoner exchange. And they, I read these speculations that maybe he'll negotiate a two-state settlement, blah, 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 blah. As if that possibility of negotiating a two-state settlement hasn't been there since the mid-1970s, a half century ago. It's not like they need a new leader. That option has been there since the mid-70s. Israel does not accept uh, the implementation of a settlement based on international law. I'm right now rereading in preparation for a debate that I'm scheduled to have with a leading figure in Israel, along with others. I'm rereading uh, Shlomo Ben Ami's book on the, he was Israel's foreign minister. And a couple of years ago, he came out with a new book on the peace process. Didn't you debate him earlier? Yes, that was a long time ago now. And he's come out with a new book. And he keeps talking. Was he better than Alan Dershowitz? You look, he's knowledgeable. He's knowledgeable. Uh, but the gist of his book was Israel was making concession after concession after concession after concession, but Arafat was lost in his fantasies. He lived in an unreal world. And then occasionally, Ben Ami specifies what is his fantasies. And what are his fantasies? His fantasies are he keeps talking about international legitimacy, and he keeps talking about UN resolutions, and he keeps talking about international law. Those are the fantasies. In other words, he wants to, he wants a settlement based on the global consensus for end, end, ending the conflict. Whereas Israel wants more then the global consensus allocates to it. And this wanting more is universe, more than what the law allocates to it. This wanting of more is universally described in this literature, scholarship, as Israeli concessions. But all of the concessions are more than what's allocated to it under international law. Let's take one example. I have to be careful about time because I have work to do. Uh, let's take one example. So what's called the peace process, there was one famous interlude called the Camp David uh, negotiations, which had three components. They were presided over by President Clinton, and they included on one side Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and on the other side Yasser Arafat. And it, as I said, they had three, it was a sequence of three events. The first event occurs in July 2000, uh, and those negotiations didn't go anywhere. Uh, even Shlomo Ben Ami, the foreign minister at the time, acknowledged later in the debate with me, he stated, quote, if I were a Palestinian, I wouldn't have accepted what was offered at Camp David. Then in December of the same year, President Clinton entered in a substantive way and stated what he called, what came to be called the Clinton parameters. And the Clinton parameters were his formula for ending the conflict. And they since have been kind of immortalized as the essential terms for ending the conflict. So what did the, the Clinton parameters say? I'll give you a few examples. Number one, that Israel should be able to keep 
80% of its settlers within Israel, that territory should be annexed from the West Bank to enable Israel to keep 80% of its settlers. But under international law, all those settlements are illegal. So Clinton gave his blessing to Israel getting to keep 80% of the settlers in place. Now, there are all sorts of formulas presented by the Palestinians to enable a certain percentage of the settlers to stay in place. Eventually, that percentage was 60%, okay? So Israel wants to keep 80%. Clinton gives his blessing to the 80%. The Palestinians present formulas so that about 60% can stay in place. Now, under international law, every single settler is illegally in the West Bank. Who's making the concessions? Who is making the concessions? The way it's the way it's described, Israel is making the concessions, and the Palestinians are being stubborn. Let's take another example. In a famous formula, Clinton says regarding Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, Arab Jerusalem, he says. What's Arab should go to the Palestinians. What's Jewish should go to Israel. That sounds like a nice formula, but there's a problem with that formula. A large part of what's Jewish in East Jerusalem are illegal settlements. So once again, Clinton is giving his blessing to those illegal settlements. Now, the illegal settlements were built in such a way as to surround the Palestinian or the Arab areas in Jerusalem to encircle them. So what seems like a reasonable formula, in fact, is a double setback for the Palestinians. One, it's legalizing the illegal settlements in Jerusalem, and B, it ends up isolating the Palestinians in the Arab settlements because they're surrounded by this ring, what came to be called the ring of settlements around Jerusalem. So who's making the concessions? What happened is Clinton gave his blessing to all of the Ill illegalities that Israel had consolidated since 1967. Now there was, it's true, under the Clinton plan, there would be very limited actual Israeli annexation of Palestinian land. That's true. I'm not going to argue with the facts. But there were two problems with that. Number one, there were supposed to be land swaps. And the position of the Palestinians was the land that was swapped had to be of equal quality and equal size. But they weren't given land of equal quality. They were being told to take some desert land near Gaza. When, were, you, when you say quality, do, do you mean agrarian productivity? Well, the, the truth is that's not an easy notion, what you mean by equality. Because, okay, there were two different terms used. Equal size no, equal swaps and equitable swap, swaps. So those terms were not easily defined because you could have an equal size in territory, but the quality of it was not equal. Let's say Israel was going to annex some of the most uh, richest agricultural land. And they were being told that they would be getting 
desert area adjacent to Gaza in return. I don't want to get into all the technicalities, but the record shows, the record shows, in my opinion, unequivocally, A, the Palestinians were doing everything they can to be reasonable. They wanted to end this thing and get a state already. They were doing everything they could to be reasonable. But they were very fixed on details. They wanted a state that works. So there were these big settlement blocks which bisected and trisected the West Bank. One called Ariel in the north, another called Male Adumim in the center. And they were very focused on trying to make certain that the state that they would get in the end would be a viable state. So I thought they were very professional about that. We have the written record, you know, you can see it. And secondly, the fact of the matter is, all the concessions came from the Palestinians. If you use as your baseline international law, if you use as your baseline international law, it was Palestinians who were asked to make concessions on the illegal settlements, it was Palestinians who were asked to make concessions on the borderline that was described in June 1967 uh, that eventually was, uh, was effaced when Israel occupied the West Bank. It was Palestinians who were being asked effectively to totally give up on the right of return of the refugees. That was another component of the uh, Clinton parameters, which basically meant Palestinians get nothing on the refugees, period, zero, case closed. And they were uh, asked to make concessions, huge concessions on Jerusalem, which under international law went to the Palestinians. Every UN resolution speaks of the occupied West Bank, parentheses, including East Jerusalem, every single refer every single resolution. The occupied Palest uh, West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Uh, they were asked to make huge concessions there. Every concession was by the Palestinians. So this notion that we now need the savior, Marwan Barghouti, no, you don't need Marwan Barghouti. All you had to do for the past 50 years is all you had to do was uh, respect international law and the conflict would have been over. That's all you had to do. Can I leave you with one or two quick questions, if you allow? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just switching, uh, you know, gears a little bit away from Palestine, but also related. I want to bring you back to the to your reply uh, to or, or response to Sam Harris because I think even beyond Palestine, at least since the American war on terror, there has been a humongous rise in global Islamophobia. And I, I wanted to ask you this question because being in India, you would know how much Islamophobia has increased now under Hindu nationalists. So you responded to what is often presented as an argument which says that the Islamic world has not undergone any renaissance or civilization. And when I was reading your very short response, I went back to you remember Huntington's uh, 1992 June 1st uh, or 91 June 1st uh, article on foreign affairs. And I just wanted to leave you on the, with this quotation for, for, to response because I think that they were somehow connected. He, he wrote, and I quote, at a superficial level, much of Western culture has indeed permeated the rest of the world. At a more basic level, however, Western concepts differ fundamentally from those prevalent in other civilizations. Western ideas of individualism, liberalism, constitutionalism, human rights, equality, liberty, the rule of law, democracy, free markets, the separation of church and state often have little resonance in Islamic, Confucian, Hindu, Buddhist, and Orthodox cultures. Your response to, to that. 
I don't want to be glib about these things. There have been major, major, uh, I hate to use words like progress, strides, advances. I'm not sure how to put it. But certainly in terms of respecting the humanity of uh, persons whose humanity wasn't respected for a long time, uh, I've seen in my own lifetime uh, a huge amount of change. And I think overwhelmingly the change has been for the, po uh, for the better. And I'm glad that the world that I live in now is not the world that I was born into in 1953. If you go and watch, I like to watch some of the old game shows, which have a, a literate quality to them. There's one which I would highly recommend to your listeners. It's called Password. And Password had a very simple, uh, a very simple format. Two teams, each team composed of two people. <laughs> and you were uh, one member of each team was given a word. And then you have to use synonyms or something to convey the word to your partner. So let's say you're on my team and I have to convey a word to you. And I say, hot, you say? No, I'm in Finkelstein. No, 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 no. Seriously. Uh, hot, you would say. Okay, you have to know the game. It's all in the intonation. You say hot, and the person says cold, because okay. you know something like that. But uh -huh. obviously, uh, the words can be quite sophisticated. I don't know the meanings of some of the words. To tell you the truth, any case, why do I mention it? That was the world I which I was born into. There was never a non-white player in the program, never, never. Then they would pan the audience, the, the camera. Pan the audience. Everyone is white. Never even occurred to a black person to go to that program. Just to sit and watch. Now when they pan the audiences for game shows or the contestants, it's every nationality in the world represented. Is that not progress? Yes, it's progress. That black people can get to sit in the audience and have a nice time, you know like everybody else. So I'm not going to dispute that fact. That those represent real cultural changes for the better. But th these progresses, just to interrupt, these are not necessarily just Western. Like my right. parents say the same things. Okay. I would say many, uh, the position of women in our society is significantly to be desired. I don't like to say better or worse. I just say significantly to be desired. On the other hand, I do, there's something about Rousseau that resonates with me. And when Rousseau said that men would be monsters, were it not for the natural faculty of pity. And that it's the nature of reason that reason enables a person to stifle his or her natural impulse for pity by contriving 10,000 excuses why not to do something when you should be doing it. He has the famous line in the second discourse. He says, whenever there is a street fight, he says, the prudent man, meaning the educated man, the prudent man walks away. And it's always the market woman, what we would nowadays call the fish market woman, the uneducated, the you know, the unrefined. The, the gross. It's always the market woman who breaks up the street fight. And we have a testament to that. No. The Houthis. Right. Throwbacks to the Middle Ages. 
with their daggers and their spears. And they said, no business as usual, so long as the genocide is being is happening in Gaza. And that to me is the living expression of Rousseau's skepticism to some extent about reason and his respect for what he calls savage men or natural men. And I, I think there is truth to that. I discussed it at some length, which I don't have time now with my students, whether if you're in the being mugged in Central Park at 3 a.m. and suddenly a guardian angel descends and you're given an option by your guardian angel. The guardian angel says, would you prefer to, when you let out your scream, your primal scream, you're being mugged, uh, oh, would you prefer your guardian angel gives you two choices? A Italian from Southern Italy, who's fresh off the boat from Southern Italy, passes by when you scream, hey. or the second option is a graduate of Harvard Business School. Who would you prefer to be passing by if you are given the choice when you're being mugged at 3 a.m. and you let out that help? Definitely not Harvard. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> or University of Chicago. Absolutely. Or Chicago, yes. <laughs> Graduate of the economics department. No, no. Or, definitely not. or a person fresh off the boat from Southern Italy. You know. So um I'm I'm a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to these sorts of things. Sam Harris, I'm sure he has professional expertise in his field, which is, I understand it to be neuroscience. You really believe that? In his professional field, you know, there's no contradiction. You know, you take something like Larry Summers. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry Summers has a lot of professional distinction when it comes to economics. Whether you agree with him or not, he obviously has professional competence. But then when you listen to him discuss things like the Israel-Palestine conflict, and he calls uh, Rashi Khalidi an anti-Semite, it's like, this guy is a yenta. You know what a yenta is? Like a fish market woman in Jewish lore. Uh, a yenta, a match, uh, it's literally a, a but match. They are the, but they are the ones who intervene. What? No, 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 no. The yent is a, uh, is a, is a matchmaker. Negative, yeah. And you realize Larry Summers, when he starts talking about these topics outside his professional field, he's just a yenta. I mean, you may not like Rashid Khalidi. You might not think he's a brilliant scholar or, you know, whatever. But an anti-Semite, I would guess half of his friends are Jewish. It's like completely nuts. And the same thing with Sam Harris. He maybe he has professional competence. I'm not going to deny it in neuro in neuroscience. But when he talks about the Israel-Palestine conflict, he speaks in this dull witted monotone, as if he's being strictly objective and scientific. No, Sam, you're not being objective and scientific. You're being an imbecile. Every statement out of your mouth is stupid beyond words. He just came out with a new take. I made it through 30, 30 seconds. I couldn't even take the way he talks because it's so obviously an affectation to show the Western rational mind speaking in an even uninflected monotone like 
he's reading from a um, laboratory report. Okay. Enough uh, said. Uh, uh, can I leave you with one final personal question? You can be as brief as you like on mm -hmm. that. When I last had you, in fact, not last, I think it was one of the previous shows we had, we discussed Palestine at length. This was much before the events of October 7. You seemed very fatigued at that moment. You had recently published your book on cancel culture. And this was the moment, and we also had a phone call later after Professor Chomsky's name came up in the Jeffrey Epstein's uh, episode or whatever. And you were reading Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin at that time because this was, uh, you know, during the events in Ukraine. And I told you, I think this was following your debate with Ben Burgess. I told you that, Norman, I really like when you write about international relations. And this was not to say that I didn't enjoy your book on cancel culture, but I really think you are an expert in these issues. So I just wanted to ask you these two questions. One, how has your daily schedule, mental health, et cetera, has been affected since October 7? You have been doing so much. And are you thinking about writing another book on Palestine? Uh, October 7th was a complete disaster for me. I joke often of late that I may end up being Gaza's last victim. Uh, I knew the biographer of Stalin named Robert Tucker. Mm -hmm. There are two Robert Tuckers. This was a good Robert Tucker. Um, and he had finished two volumes and he was already getting on in years. And he hadn't finished that third volume. And then he had the worst catastrophe that could ever befall a historian. Namely, 1989 happened. The Soviet Union disintegrated. And all the archives, which had been closed for decades, were suddenly open. And so he effectively had to start from scratch. And he didn't finish that third volume. And he used to say, uh, I may end up being Stalin's last victim. And in fact, he was. He didn't finish he died before he finished that third volume. And sometimes I think I'll be Gaza's last victim uh, because I am very depleted physically, emotionally, and not so much emotionally because I don't watch anything. I have not seen one moving image either from October 7th or thereafter. I have not watched one moving image. I've seen pictures and they're actually uh, harrowing enough but I have not watched any moving image. So I have, uh, I have uh, protected myself from that emotionally. Um, and I have been working very hard, harder than I'm physically capable of. Uh, but I have the problem that wherever I go, and each morning in my email box, and for a period which only changed about two weeks ago, I was spending approximately 10 hours every day on email. It was completely hard. I would be crying at night. Please stop. Please, please stop. It's totally irrational because I didn't have to respond. But you know, I have this Chomsky super ego. He answered all the email. I have to answer all the ego. Um, and wherever I go, People just thank me, thank me, thank me. Yesterday, I teach at Hunter College one class a week. And yesterday, three or four students came up, maybe four, uh, thanking me for everything. Not students, students in the school, not my own students. Uh, just so I see in the corridors, thanking me. I'm on the subways, people come up to me. And I just keep saying, okay, mom, got to keep persevering. People are counting on you. You have to keep persevering. You gotta keep persevering. And uh, it's just been very tough to rise to the occasion, especially since so much time is consumed answering the email. 
whereas my young friends, be it Jamie Sternweiner or Yaniv Kogan or Muin Rabani, they're reading all the material that's coming out, and I'm just answering emails and answering emails and answering emails. Um, I don't think I will write. I might write reflections on the what happened after October 7th, but I actually, a lot of what I did, I did because nobody else was doing it. But nowadays, I think that the South African application to the ICJ, it covered an awful lot of ground in those 84 right. single space pages. You got a very good picture of what happened. So I don't feel the same need anymore to document. It's being documented. It's actually being documented by the South African government. Uh, so this, the kind of, you know, my day, nobody did what I did, which is to go through all the human rights supports on uh, the various Israeli high-tech massacres called operations. But nowadays, it's been very exhaustively documented and also synthesized. What the South African application did was take those hundreds, if not thousands, of UN-related reports and form a picture, a picture of genocide. But I still possess the, um, the um, perspective to say some things which others haven't said because they didn't study the record with a kind of eye for detail and reflection that I did. So I might write something on that, maybe a new introduction to the Gaza book. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty petered out. I I can completely imagine. On that note, uh, Norman, thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so, so much. Thanks. Bye. My name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider donating for the cause link is in the description below also if you are not able to do so don't feel sad you can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades finally don't forget to hit the subscribe button